one live. Gosh, when technology works, we're so happy. <laughs> and when it doesn't, we are so not happy. <laughs> Been pretty good today. Now that I've figured out how to not hear the echoing <laughs> in my headphones. <laughs> Can't have the Facebook Live playing in my ears at the same time we're on. Yeah. That was pretty ugly for the first few minutes this morning. <laughs> All right. All righty. Welcome back, everyone, for our third session of the day for the uh, Natural Pet Care Summit. And uh, this is a, a really hot topic that we're discussing for this hour, which is CBD as part of the holistic approach for pet care. Um, and I know that many of you are already using CBD on your pets, but there are also many others who would like to, but don't have enough information. So we brought together some experts. So we have Juliana Carella, and she is the CEO and founder of Anti Dolores and Treatables. You've probably heard of treatables. You probably may not have heard of Auntie Dolores. Uh, she began her career in San Francisco as a professionally trained dancer. That has a lot to do with CBD. Maybe we'll find that answer. Uh, <laughs> after having her first child, she shifted gears to formally study her long-held interest in homeopathic medicine. So we've got our second homeopath on board today, uh, enrolling at the Institute for Classical Homeopathy. In 2008, she established Auntie Dolores, a gourmet edibles bakery, 2008, that was kind of ahead of our time, uh, with the mission to change the way people consume medical cannabis. In 2013, she established Treatables, the pioneer company in the field, offering the best organic, broad-spectrum hemp oil products for animals. Partnering with master cultivators, Juliana created a proprietary formula sourced from the company's own organic hemp grown across the U.S. Juliana, welcome on board. Thank you. Thank you. For and having me. <laughs> we're thrilled. And uh, we also have Brandon Driver. And those of you who know me know that Brandon is my son-in-law. And when he and Gwen uh, got married and then uh, Gwen agreed to be the COO of Naturally Healthy Pets, and we were having problems with being able to carry and market CBD products, but I knew people needed them. Brandon jumped on board and said, man, I would love to research that and be on board. So Brandon started Naturally Healthy Hemp, which is a source of high quality CBD products for pets and people. Brandon dedicates his time to researching and vetting out all things CBD. And he's the expert resource on this topic for the team at Naturally Healthy Pets. Uh, so welcome aboard, Brandon. Thank you. I'm really honored to be here with two really amazing women. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, let's, let's start um, a little bit with, uh, we've got to talk legalities uh, and they keep changing. Um, and we're, we're going to get into what we can use CBD products for, for both ourselves and for our pets. Um, We'll talk a little bit about, you know, how you know quality of product, that sort of thing. Um, but I, I, Juliana, I, maybe you're the best one to answer this because I know you're on top of it, but I know Brandon does a ton of research as well. As a veterinarian, it's tricky for us to talk about CBD. Uh, and certainly we can't talk about using any sort of 
uh, THC containing products for pets. That would not be legal at all, at least not in the state I'm in. Um, and I think I think that's pretty much across the, the country. Mm -hmm. um, although I do know that there are dispensaries selling low THC products for use in pets. I just, it's my understanding that that's not being done legally, although mm -hmm. I don't know who's enforcing anything. Um, so maybe you can give us some answers on that. But uh, what's the big deal with veterinarians not supposed to talk about CBD, not supposed to dispense CBD, not supposed to counsel our clients on the use of CBD in pets? Can you, can you give me any idea why? <laughs> I think I have a pretty good idea as to why, and I'll, I'll try to explain all the layers that are involved because, you know, as we peel away the layers, we start to see what's really underneath. And <laughs> I mean, it is a big shame that vets have been basically, um, I feel like they've been suppressed uh, by the ABMA. And I know that letters went out a couple of years ago across the country, um, threatening vets, you know, and making them, uh, feel like if they were going to even discuss CBD with their patients, that they would be in hot water. And so I think that really set the tone, unfortunately. And um, we work with hundreds of vets across the country, but of course, they're like yourself, they're pioneers in the space. They're willing to maybe take chances because they, they want this product in their toolkit. They wanna to be able to uh, suggest it for their patients. So. You know, there's a handful of vets across the country that are uh, falling in that category, but I do believe that many, many more would like to have the freedom, as you mentioned. I mean, it's um, hands down, obviously, it's going to be some of the best medicine you can give to your animals for certain conditions. Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole plethora of other conditions that researchers are starting to realize can also be ameliorated by phytocannabinoids. So, there's a lot more that needs to happen in terms of allowing vets to um, prescribe and suggest these. And it really, I think it just does go back to the fact that it hasn't been proved um, by the FDA. It hasn't gone through proper drug trials, although it actually has in other contexts. So we, we see Epidiolex uh, was released a couple of years ago by GW Pharma that went through all the FDA trials but that's specifically for children with mm -hmm. Dravet syndrome. So it's a very specific uh, usage of CBD. Can we take that and say, okay, now that we know that children can become ameliorated uh, by CBD if they have seizures, then why can't dogs and cats? Well, as you know, if it's not been drug tested on dogs and cats, then we can't say it, but we all know just, just as glucosamine became popular for animals 20 years ago because people started giving it to their animals, the same thing's happening with CBD. And luckily with the farm bill passing, we've got more research now. So it's, it's starting to move the needle, but there's still restrictions. And I think eventually that'll change, but there's, it's just a very complex issue. Um, it is, and I know we are seeing, uh, there is a veterinary owned CBD company and um, so, of course, they're trying to push the veterinary owned company onto the veterinarians, uh, but they have done some research. Uh, they enlisted some help up at Cornell uh, at the vet school there. So I mean, the good news is we are starting to get some research published. Um, and I know at the AFCO meeting a few years ago, uh, the hemp industry representatives from Colorado stood up and said, hey, we are doing a ton of research because AFCO and FDA have said, no way can you put hemp products in pet feed or pet treats, anything that's considered food. Mm -hmm. It can be in supplements maybe, uh, but it can't be in food. But the uh, Colorado reps, I mean, thank goodness for them because they stood up and said, well, it's coming down the pike and we are doing the research. And sooner or later, you're going to have to take your fingers out of your ears and open your eyes and agree that there's some merit to using these products, whether it's in feed. I mean, it, uh, there's a cattle rancher up in Montana who's growing fields and fields and fields of hemp, feeding it to his cows. He's not allowed to sell it to anybody else to feed to their cows, but he's feeding it to his own. But it makes the, uh, the Montana feed authorities 
a little crazy. Like the guy from Montana stood up at the AFCO meeting and he said, I just can't wait to retire because this farmer is making my life miserable because he wants to be able to sell it to other farmers for use in their cattle as well. I mean, hemp is a, is a great plant source, so why yeah. not? Um, okay, and I'm going to ask a question. I did a, an interview for uh, a different, for a dog radio podcast thing uh, earlier in the week on CBD. <laughs> I thought, I don't know if you have the right person for this, but uh, one of the things that we talked about was the NASC Supplement mm-hmm. Council. And I said that I didn't know if any CBD companies had gone through the process for NASC. So I'm going to go with you have. Yeah, we were the first company to get the seal. And it was not easy, by the way. I mean, no. it's a very stringent process, as it should be. Mm-hmm. But what, what I really love about the NASC is they, they started 20 years ago because glucosamine was given to pets because people knew it would be good for them. And it turned out it was, but the FDA clamped down and said, no, you can't give this human product to your animals. CBD is following a very similar path 20 years later. And the NASC is really the only organization out there that has established a clear path to compliance for us. And what it basically means is you're right. We can't be a food. We also can't be a supplement because supplements and foods are actually in the same category. A supplement Mm. supplements those nutrients that the food may not give the animal. So we're in another category altogether and that's a dosage form product. So as long (laughs) as a pet CBD product is labeled appropriately as a dosage form product and it has all of the proper verbiage on the packaging and it doesn't make any egregious claims and all of those things, then it's legal but there's just a, a lot of parameters involved and it's very confusing. It's often counterintuitive. And at the end of the day, it, it sort of confuses the customer more than it clarifies things for them. So it's, it's, yes. uh, it's, it's a, it, there's a level of frustration for anybody that's dealing with this because it's, it is just, um, it's so counterintuitive in some ways, you know? What we want to put on our packaging and what we can put on our packaging are two very different things. So is, is FDA in charge of telling you that you have to put things like it's a 250 milligram bottle, it's a 500 milligram bottle, because CBD is the only product I know that does it that way. And I get literally daily, I don't know if Brandon gets them, but I get daily emails, text messages, whatever from people saying, how much of this do I give my pet? And when I do consultations, they're like, well, I'm using XYZ brand of uh, CBD. And I'm like, great, what's the strength? How much are you giving? Yeah. And people, yeah. people are clueless. They can't do the math. Like, why is it so difficult? Well, part of the problem is there's over 250 CBD pet brands in the space. And there's only like 10 or 15 that are NASC sealed. So I didn't know there were that many. <laughs> and, and, and the NASC actually sits down with the FDA CBM and hammers out, how do we make these products legal? How can they you know, remain in the market and not get pulled by state inspectors? Um, so that message is being missed by the majority of the brands that are out there. So you have a lack of standards with packaging. And this is why customers are so confused because there's so many brands and most of them are out of compliance. And then the labeling practices are all over the map that you just don't have the standardization that you need to uh, clear away any of that confusion. So it's, it's a hot mess. <laughs> It is a hot mess. And, uh, you know, I, I've probably, I, I think every consult I do, the, every, they're using a different CBD. Yeah. And I, I'm surprised there's only 250 because I, <laughs> although half of them are using human products, so there's yeah. probably 10,000. Uh, they're all over the clay, place. Yeah. And then, you know, we get the, well, it's hemp seed oil. And I'm like, Ugh. that's not even CBD. Uh, so it's really, really confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I get the, wait, you want me to use what brand? And it's how much money? And I'm like, that's because it's actually CBD oil. It's actually a good one. It's not hemp seed oil. That yeah. stuff that you're paying $16 a bottle on Amazon that's called hemp seed oil is kind of equivalent to flaxseed oil Yeah, as far as what it's going to offer to the body. Has health benefits, but won't take away the seizures. Won't right. has health can- benefits, but it's totally different. The- it won't help with separation anxiety and, and won't help with arthritis, you know? No, it might make their coat a little shinier. Yeah. Give them a little vitamin E. 
it's also, it's so hard to tell anybody, this is how much you should be taking, this is what you should be adhering to as far as a regimen, or this is your starting dosage, when just like that same 250 milligram bottle or 750 milligram bottle, you have companies like Treatables and anti that are doing it the right way, and you can cross-reference their certificate of analysis and say, okay, this is exactly how much CBD is in here. So that way I have a starting point and I know this is how much I should be giving, but you can look at some companies, they'll say it's a 500 milligram product and they've got 50, maybe 60 milligrams of actual CBD in there. And if you look at the verbiage, it's a hemp seed extract blend that's full spectrum. And then you get into confusion with full spectrum versus PCR versus CBD versus isolates. And it's just, it's so out in left field that there are so many companies that just won't do it the right way. And they're into it to make a product that's cost effective, but not the best. So this is why Brandon is in charge of researching this stuff. Cause what he just said, I think my eyes glazed over and I went, I, I can't even like begin to discern all of the, the stuff um, that goes on. We just had this great discussion on food a couple of hours ago and you know, your eyes will glaze over when you hear what's going on in the pet food industry. Um, But you know, it is really difficult for, for pet owners to understand what they're getting and what the quality of the product is. So Brandon, I know that you represent treatables um, for, for naturally healthy hemp, that uh, they are one of the products that uh, you stand behind and are very happy with. Um, and you don't have very many different brands. How do you choose? What are you looking for? What should people be looking for uh, to determine? Uh, I mean, certainly they could just go to naturally healthy hemp and say, hey, he already did the research. I don't have to do the research. Or they can go to treatables and say, they already did the research. I don't have to do the research. But let's say they're not in this country. Let's say they're somewhere else. Or if they are in this country and they you know, go to the local pet store and the pet store says, well, we stand behind this brand and it's you know, something we've never heard of. What should they look for? How do they determine? What do you look for, Brandon, when, when you decide whether or not a product meets your specs? Well, fortunately, uh, we happen to have a uh, you know, good working relationship with Treatables. And that was actually the first brand that we started carrying. And the entire team, you guys are fantastic and we love what you're doing. Thank you. Um, yeah, we do. In order to meet the standards for what we say we want to carry, and we actually, we put them in with every order and we put it on the uh, website as well, but it's got to be full spectrum. Mm-hmm. It's got to be solvent free, heavy metal free, pesticide free. We want it to be organic. We want it to be the best that we can possibly find, but we also want a company that's going to do it the right way, that we know that they're into it with the mindset that we want to change the way that pets and owners and their lives, how can we help them and how can we make this the easiest for them so that they don't have to guess, uh, you know, is this company out just to make money off of me or are they out to actually change something? And that, I think, says a lot about it because you can find a great product and then the company changes the next day before you even know it and the product goes downhill with it. So we try and find companies that we can stand behind. And really the big thing and a lot of it, if you can't find a company that we can sell or a company that can sell to you locally, because there's a lot of issues with international shipping, the biggest advice that I can give is to make sure that it's full spectrum make sure that you read the COA. And if a company is not willing to post a certificate of analysis along with the product, I personally won't buy it. Um, On that COA, are you looking for a COA with a batch number that corresponds to the batch number that's for sale? Or is it okay for a company to do a COA on their first batch and then just use that on going forward? Well, if you think about it, kind of like similar, to, most people are familiar with Carfax. Uh, if you look at a COA that's for a different batch number and a different product, then it's kind of like looking at a Carfax for a different car other than the one that you're buying. And the one that you're buying might have been slammed into a telephone pole four years ago. <laughs> I mean, if it, it should correspond to that product. Most of them will have a product of the picture on there. And a lot of people will make it nice and convenient. 
and you'll have QR codes and you'll have the identifying batch number and lot number stamped on the bottle and then also with the COA. Uh, that's one of our harder things is to make sure that our Google Drive links with the website work every time we update with the new product. Yeah. Um, mm. Yeah. See, this is why I don't want to do these things. This is way too much work. Uh, so uh, you've said full spectrum. What does a full spectrum, and either one of you can answer this, but what does it mean when a product is full spectrum and what would be the opposite? I guess that would be an isolate. So what's the difference in uh, where the CBD is coming from and how it affects the animal or the person? So full spectrum basically means that it contains all of the naturally occurring cannabinoids in the hemp plant that the oil was extracted from. So when we plant our hemp seeds into the ground in order to, you know, grow these plants and then pull them and extract the oils, we're taking everything with it because we want the CBDA, we want the CBG, we want the CBC, we want that little bit of THC that's naturally occurring. All of those things create what's called the entourage effect, which means those cannabinoids are going to work really well together synergistically in that formulation. When we give a CBD isolate, that's just isolated CBD. So we've taken the oil from the plant, but then we take another step and pull just the CBD out and leave everything else behind. Um, that looks more like a pharmaceutical drug because that's, for instance, Epidiolex, the, the medicine we were talking about earlier, that's made from isolated CBD. There's no other cannabinoids in there. And research has shown that um, when we can provide that entourage effect, when we've got those other supporting cannabinoids in the formulation, it actually helps to make the CBD work better. And all of those minor cannabinoids also do a lot of the work too. So it's more effective and it's not going to have the type of um, results that just drop off over time. There's also broad spectrum, which is like full spectrum, but it means that the THC specifically has been removed. So a broad spectrum oil might have CBD, CBG, CBC, but it won't have THC. And um, personally, we don't make any broad spectrum products because we like to keep um, the we like to keep this oil in the most naturally occurring state that it's already in. And the fact of the matter is that that small amount of THC actually adds some benefit. It's not enough to create static ataxia. It's not enough to get the animal high, but it's just a teeny, teeny, tiny, tiny amount. It's almost non-detectable. And even that little amount is advantageous. And, but all the animal products have to be less than was it 0.3? Point three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, point three all hemp products in general. So hemp is no longer cannabis because it it is has less than 0.3% THC. And that's really the defining factor in the hemp plant. It has, you know, all those cannabinoids, but it has less than 0.3% THC. And that's just something that these plant breeders figured out years ago, how to manipulate the cannabis plant and make it look like a hemp plant and basically have the chemical composition that would allow us to extract the CBD and not have all that THC in there. So let's say someone has a five pound dog mm -hmm. and they buy a bottle of a thousand milligram full spectrum. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very concentrated product. Yeah. If they like seriously overdose their dog, like they gave a whole ML yeah. Would there be enough THC in there to cause an issue for that tiny dog? Um, there actually could be because a thousand, if it's a 30 milliliter bottle, a thousand milligrams, each milliliter is going to give probably 30 to 40 milligrams right. of CBD. Now, depending on the ratio of CBD to THC in that formulation, a five pound dog could develop static ataxia from like a half a milligram of THC. So theoretically, you're absolutely right. A, an animal could have a negative effect from that product. Um, and, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about how, you know, these products are safe and effective and they don't have side effects and you can't overdose an animal. Um, the worst that's ever happened with a treatables product is the animal has a really good nap and they might <laughs> urinate on themselves. You know, they lose control of their urinary system. We don't want that to happen though. So we always suggest start with the low dose and the, uh -huh. the dosage range is anywhere from one milligram per 10 pounds 
to one milligram per pound. And as long as customers stay within that range, they're never gonna have any static ataxia from THC toxicity. They're never gonna have any THC toxicity symptoms and they won't uh, give too much to their animal, but it's different than pharmaceutical drugs. You have to wait and see how the animal responds and they're all a bit different. Um, right. So, you know, you might have a five pound dog that needs five milligrams of CBD, but you might have another five pound dog, same breed, same issues, same everything. And they might need less than a half a milligram of CBD to get the same effect. And you might not know that until you start giving it to the animal. Yeah. I, I, I tell people all the time, look, you know, these, these doses are not carved in stone and, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of guessing until we get a lot more studies. Yeah. And I think it's going to vary product to product as well. Um, you know, we, we tend to use the one milligram per 10 pounds of body weight twice a day as our starting point to mm -hmm. see how they're going to react. Mm -hmm. But we certainly have tons of room to move mm -hmm. if um, we're not getting the desired effect. Uh, the other thing that I tell people quite commonly because they're coming at me with brands that I know nothing about, I can look on their website quickly and go, well, you know, you know, everybody's going to put the, what you want to see on yeah. the website or, you know, what they think you want to see. Um, but in, if I don't have a relationship with the company, there's no way for me to, you know, it's kind of like the pet food companies that lie on their website and go, yeah, we're human grade while they're getting it from the dead animal guy down the road. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> nobody, nobody goes over those websites to say, Hey, you're lying. Um, so we, so we really don't know. Uh, but my caution here and why the question about the five pound dog and overdosing, if you are buying human products that might be more concentrated, you don't necessarily know what you're getting. And unless you can do the math to figure out how many drops of that you should be giving, um, I'm just throwing a little word of caution out there. <laughs> you know, could you potentially, I did have someone, oh man, was a client in either Oregon or Washington. And it was a place where they could go legally to a dispensary and they could get a product that had, uh, significantly more THC in it. Mm -hmm. um, and they were told it was safe for their dog and uh, the dog fell down the steps. So yeah. it was a little too much. I said, yeah. I, I, so this, <laughs> this, is, this is part of the misunderstanding with cannabinoids. And I, I just, it's unfortunate because, you know, when you extract CBD from the cannabis plant, you almost can't take the THC with it. And that THC content is going to be a lot higher. So if you're a pet parent and you want to give your CBD to your pets, you have to avoid the human products that come from dispensaries because they're made from cannabis and cannabis naturally has a higher THC content. So there's no way to extract the oil from that cannabis and remove that CBD. It would be such an expensive process to do that. So it just, it's just not done. And the other part of this is that humans, when they consume CBD, they might actually need a little bit of THC for it to work really well. And our systems are completely different. We're not nearly as sensitive. We can handle a lot more. And frankly, we might like getting high, whereas our dogs don't like that. <laughs> so they kind of like being all controlled. to consider uh, pets should stick to hemp CBD products if they really want to avoid THC toxicity. That's yeah. the best way to just avoid it. Yep. Dogs have uh, many, many more CBD1 receptors in their nervous system than people do, which is why they're so much more sensitive to it. So we have to be a, a lot more careful with what yep. we're giving them. And uh, the, um, the pet industry, the pet poison control centers, once a state legalizes marijuana, they are getting many, many, many more uh, cases of uh, marijuana toxicity, THC toxicity in pets. So um, it's not fun to get your pets high. Please don't do it. It's they don't do well with it. And I don't recommend it. Uh, so let's talk about um, things that I, I'm sure that you get contacted a lot, Juliana, with, um, you know, pet parents saying, well, my dog or cat has seizures or allergies or IBD. Um, what are the most common questions or reasons your company is asked, you know, would this help? Um, and 
what's been your experience with what kind of benefits people are getting for those conditions? Great question. So the number one reason that people are purchasing these products for their pets, um, at least treatable products would be for separation anxiety. And then the number two reason is for joint inflammation and pain of any kind, whether that's hip dysplasia or even from an injury or any, anything that falls in that category, that would be number two. Um, number three is, is seizures of any kind. So epileptic seizures, you know, all the different kinds that there are, that would probably be the number three reason that uh, pet parents are seeking out these products for their pets. And then there's, honestly, so many other conditions that we hear about all the time, because as you probably know, pet parents, they'll choose a product for their animal to address, you know, anxiety, and then they give it to their animal and they realize, oh, that limp that my dog had also went away. And, you know, my dad, my dog has Cushing's disease and he's got all these other symptoms, but I was treating him for the anxiety, but it happened to help all these other symptoms over here too. And we get that a lot. Um, so we keep adding to that list of conditions, and I know that research is now allowing that list to get longer as well. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, when this is all said and done and we've got, you know, a lot more research behind us, I think that list is going to be really long. But anxiety and arthritis and epilepsy are definitely our top three. Which is interesting because uh, we haven't done a pet expo since February because of all the lockdowns and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but when we would have our booth at expos, um, the number one reason someone would stop by our booth and not asking specifically about CBD, but the number one reason people would step, stop in our booth was anxiety, mm -hmm. whether it was separation anxiety or you know the people who decided that a pet expo with 15,000 people and a bunch of barking dogs was the best way to get their dog used to being in large crowds. You know, <laughs> they come up to me with these dogs whose eyes are bugging out of their head. They're bright red and their tongues are hanging out and they're panting and shaking. And I'm like, ah, I'll sell you something, but you really just need to go put them in the car and get out of here. Uh, but anxiety is huge for our pets. And I don't know whether we're all a bunch of crazy people and we make our pets anxious. I can tell you that right now, because of COVID and lockdowns, and it's a good thing for the shelters and the rescues, people have taken in more foster animals. People have adopted more animals. Veterinary clinics are so far behind and there's a veterinary shortage. So uh, mm. getting all these animals in, is, is it, it's having a snowball effect down the line. Uh, but part of the problem is these animals are used to having people in their home 24 seven because the kids are being homeschooled and the mom and dad are working from home. Mm -hmm. And at some point, everybody's going to vacate the house. Mm -hmm. Kids are going to go to school. Parents are going to go to work. And these animals are going to go. And they're literally going to pee themselves and destroy your house. So mm -hmm. we got to start working on that. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I just, it's so sad, but anxiety in animals was already so bad before COVID and now it's just gotten worse. And, and you're right, there's been an uptick in adoptions. But there's also been an uptick in um, animals being brought back to shelters because there's so much uh, instability financially right now. And, and sadly, many pet, new pet parents are bringing their dogs and cats back to the rescue because they can't, can't continue. We really love using CBD for all of those transitions in life, whether it's uh, the new um, shelter animal coming home to their new forever home. That's a fantastic time to give a treatables product to help with that transition. Uh, like you said, when parents and kids are going back to school and work, great time to start giving it. I mean, you can't, you can't get ahead of it enough. It's almost like you want to give it to the animal before they even start to feel that way. I've yes. got a new animal. I, I adopted a rescue, a blue healer from the Nashville Humane a couple months ago. She's just a puppy. She doesn't have any health problems yet, but she had separation anxiety. I got her dosed on treatables before she even came inside my house. And <laughs> since then, we've, we haven't had any separation anxiety at all, like not even one little episode. And she just chills. And I really notice a difference when she's not on it. Like that's when she's just hyper and she's looking around. She's the stimuli are just too much for her. You can't even take her out on a walk without her 
darting across the street to go say hi to somebody because she just can't not say. But when I give her the CBD before the walk, she's just chill and she doesn't freak out. She doesn't have any stimuli that's making her go crazy. And it just, it just works so well. So, I mean, it's a great way to help the pet parent ease their own anxiety. Cause as you know, your animal's anxious, you're going to be anxious. And then it just feeds the animal's anxiety. And it's just this vicious loop. It is. And you, you just made me realize I need to give a whopping dose of CBD to our new, she came from a private home. So she's, she was a breeding dog, but in a, a very good breeder, but she came from a home that had like, I don't know, 30 dogs oh, wow. and she's our number four. Um, and they said, oh, she's really good at walking on the leash. And she's just the sweetest little dog. She loves to go for a walk, but she's not used to traffic. They lived in a very mm -hmm. quiet neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so if I make the mistake of taking her out and we live in a small town, so rush hour traffic is not like a huge deal, yeah. but there are cars and trucks going by mm -hmm. and she literally just starts darting back and forth and then she'll stop dead in her tracks and just about kill me every time she does it because I'm, you know, I'm like, I don't know where you are. You're all over the place. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need a lot more CBD for this dog. So <laughs> Brandon, I know when we were at your house recently with the addition of Sarah, um, there's two things that you guys are using CBD for your pets for in your house. One is the new addition. So you can tell us how that helped you. Uh, but the second was after Mila's surgery. So give us a little rundown on how often you were using the CBC, CBD, what effects you saw and how it helped with those transitions. Well, the biggest one, and I think most of your followers know about your new granddaughter, but Sarah Marie is our newest addition. She's three months now. Congratulations. And bringing a baby home has been a big change on the pets. They're used to being able to lay on the couch. They're used to being able to lay on top of us. They're used to having 24-7 attention, and they get maybe 5% of the attention that they really want. The cats are upset that they're locked out of the bedroom. The dogs are upset that they can't be on the couch because if somebody comes to the door, they want to run over the couch and jump over the baby. And we just can't have that. <laughs> Keeping the home and trying to de decrease the stimulus on them. That has been a really big thing. Um, Let's see. I think we actually have the treatable 750 that we've been giving for both. Um, and that's been for that and also surgery where she decided that she thought a diaper looked very tasty and resulted in about a foot and a half long incision to remove, I think, I cannot remember, but it was a large number of baby wipes and it did not quite make it through. Oh, so her laying around in her cone of shame, laying on the floor and not being able to lick herself. And she was just very upset. So the CBD with throughout her healing process, but also to kind of keep her calm, to keep her from licking at herself as much and it, all the stimulus of, we also had family in town and to kind of help out with the workload of trying to prepare for the upcoming summit, the upcoming Black Friday, having the baby, Mila's surgery, um, so on the pets are a big thing, but also the CBD has been very helpful for me. Uh, <laughs> the, the long nights with the baby, not getting much sleep, the sore back from rocking her. It's, it's really been a blessing. Oh man. It's kind of a big, it, it's a big part of our life for the whole family. And I didn't even think about that when I was down there because Sarah Marie, she's adorable, but she's, I don't know, 12 or 13 pounds now. And I love holding her and spending time with her. Sarah loves to be held by me standing up. You sit down and you get a screaming baby. So you know, everybody laughed and left me in charge for about two and a half hours. And by the end of the two and a half hours, I was like, can I put this thing down? I feel like I love this child, but seriously, I need to put her down. She might um, need some CBD. <laughs> yes. Where? <laughs> what was I thinking? <laughs> there was plenty right there. <laughs> well, they give it to babies. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's it's certainly. Um, so, uh, okay. Well, we're, we're going to ask Juliana the science behind um, how does it help with the inflammatory problems, like the joint pain, the arthritis. 
Yeah, and I think it's it's similar to any anything that it's helping. It's just activating the endocannabinoid system. Anytime that an animal takes in, you know, a full spectrum formulation that's you know mostly CBD, it immediately goes to those receptors that are interested in interacting with it, and those receptors are so um, interconnected to the nervous system, right? So the nervous system has this incredible interplay with endocannabinoid system. And when the endocannabinoid system is calm and healthy and on the right track, then the nervous system just follows along, right? So anything that uh, the nervous system or the joints and inflammation, all of those things just start to resolve when the endocannabinoid system is put back in order. So, and it's just, it's just that affinity to the joints and all of that, that um, that's something that, you know, we've known about CBD for a long time is that affinity, not only to the nervous system, but also to, you know, the joints and arthritis and all of that. So it's really a calming of the endocannabinoid system that brings that balance back to the animal system. Yeah, I actually took a, um, a pain course took me a while to get through it uh, about six months ago. And there was a whole section on CBD and where it comes into play along the nerve endings and how it blocks the transmission of those pain signals. And then it also blocks that inflammatory pathway. Mm -hmm. um, I would never be able to, I, I would just have to hold up the diagrams and go here. It's very complicated. Uh, I really, it took me six hours to take an open book test. <laughs> This is ridiculous. Um, it, it's very complicated, but it it has such a huge effect in blocking that pain signal. Mm -hmm. And um, so, one of the questions that uh, I get asked quite often is, how many times a day could you dose it? So, let's say you have a pet who responds to it really well, but it only seems to last four or five hours. I think it's great to get ahead of that, you know, the duration when you see it starting to taper off, just give another dose. I mean, it's kind of like the dosage amount itself. You can give as much as you think is needed for that animal. Well, you can give it as frequently as you think is needed for that animal too. And going up to six doses a day would literally be every four hours. Yeah. Um, and we've got tons of customers that are, you know, they have their animals on an every three to four hour regimen. Yeah, I, I do know there's been uh, quite a few. So I heard a lecture, uh, great study on uh, seizures in children, mm -hmm. uh, children who were not expected to live very long, but and mostly because they have, you know, it's something they're born with, but they have, you know, 50 seizures a day, which I can't even imagine as a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, but they found that dosing these children every four hours would make them almost seizure free. So they might have a couple during the 24 hour period, but nothing like what it was. And the children actually lived much longer to be mm -hmm. <clears throat> into their teens, which normally they would be respect expected to live, you know, a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they had to figure out how much was it going to take and how often were they going to have to give it to prevent that breakthrough. And I, I think we need to keep that in mind when we're using something for our pets and we're like, I don't see a difference. I don't think it's working. Um, it may be that we just haven't found that threshold dose for yeah. that particular pet, uh, whether that's number of milligrams per dose or number of doses per day. Yep. That's exactly right. I mean, a hundred percent. And often, you know, when customers call us and they say, well, I tried the low dose and I didn't see anything happen, move up to the next, you know, the next dose. And if that doesn't work, keep moving up until you hit that one milligram per pound. You might even have to surpass that as well. Um, like I said about Delilah, my new dog, she doesn't really have any health problems at all, but she just doesn't respond to anything less than 20 to 25 milligrams and she's 30 pounds. So that's a pretty high dose. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, but I can't explain why that is. Um, the important thing is just give the animal what they need, whether it's, you know, 20 milligrams, 50 milligrams, hundred, and then give it every three hours, three, four hours is needed. Um, so uh, another thing that I see many articles uh, on the internet, um, and then of course they get sent to me, well, what do you think of this? Um, 
that there are websites that will say that CBD will interact with medications that utilize the cytochrome P450 liver enzyme system for metabolism. And that because of that, perhaps uh, if we have pets that have liver disease, um, elevated liver enzymes, or are on any of those medications that utilize the cytochrome P450 system, that they should not use CBD. Have you experienced anything through your company um, where you've, you've gotten reports of interactions with medications or problems with animals that have liver disease or animals that have elevated liver enzymes? We haven't seen a ton of that, but we did have um, one case who we suggested that she actually alternate so she was doing the CBD and then, you know, the next dose was the other medicine and, and so forth. And that seemed to work fine. Um, again, this is an area where we need more research because we don't know. Um, but then I always go back to, you know, what Raphael Mishulam, who discovered CBD and has researched it for many decades, he says it's the safest chemical he's ever researched. So I, I tend to think, um, you know, if I were a pet parent, I'd probably go ahead and try to figure out how to incorporate it somehow. But I can see why some pet parents would have hesitations. Obviously, that's I, I don't think that's very, coming from the pet parents as much as that's coming from the veterinarians. Yeah. Um, and that's just because of a lack of knowledge, I think. Um, and I can honestly say that all of our dogs are on CBD and uh, they are on medications that are on those lists. Yeah. Uh, we had one dog that went into acute liver failure. He was on CBD. Um, I stopped it for about a week while we were kind of straightening him out. Mm -hmm. And as soon as his enzyme started to come back down, cause he, I mean, we had a, a, an ultrasound done and they said, wow, 20% of his liver just died this week. We don't know why. Oh man. Yeah. We have no clue. No clue. His, <laughs> it was really weird. His only symptom was he was pooping more than normal, not even diarrhea just pooping wow. like five times a day. And I was like, why, why are you pooping so much? It was huh. the weird, weirdest thing ever. He wasn't acting sick at all. He's eating, running around, ran lab work just to, cause I can. And yeah. I went, that's not right. Yeah. I, through the roof. Uh, so I stopped at CBD for uh, a week while we got things back under control, retested him. I, he, he basically took care of the problem himself. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then I put him right back on it and uh, his enzymes continued to come down. So I wasn't worried about it, but it was, it was kind of one of those things where you go, huh, you know, maybe that, maybe it's a problem. We don't know. Again, we don't have enough research, mm -hmm. uh, but I can certainly say that I have had plenty of patients with elevated liver enzymes that we've used, you know, Cushing's dog, mm -hmm. very difficult to find a Cushing's dog that doesn't have elevated liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. It's just part of the disease process. Yeah. Yet the, the CBD can be very helpful for them. Yeah, we, like I said, we've got um, one of the very first testimonials that came in years and years ago was a little chihuahua with Cushing's disease. He had a brain tumor, <laughs> had so many problems. He was running around in circles all day, chasing his tail, just neurotic, completely neurotic. That was the first thing that went away with this dog was the tail, chasing the tail all day long. Awesome. Then after that, some of the Cushing's disease symptoms were being ameliorated by the product. And, you know, the animal ended up living another year and a half and the pet parents were just astonished at how well that, that he did on the product. But, you know, back then we didn't have any data on it. We just didn't even know what to make of that. We were thrilled, of course, but we just sure. didn't, this was seven, eight years ago. And we were like, wow, this animal with Cushing's disease, who we probably would have been scared to give the product to normally had an amazing turnaround on the product. So, it's exciting. We've only scratched the surface, really. Oh, yeah. So much more to know. I can't Absolutely. wait. I can't wait for like 10 years from now. It'll just be like all these questions we have now, I think will be like, oh, we know the answer. Well, I think we'll have a lot more research. And uh, we have Cavalier King Charles Spaniels and mm -hmm. English Toy Spaniels. And they all have syringomyelia and Chiari mm -hmm. malformation, which are two neurologic problems that cause um, excessive scratch, air scratching, mm -hmm. rolling, um, can cause seizures. I mean, it's just, it's a huge issue. It's a very painful disease for these mm -hmm. dogs. And um, when I started looking at CBD, 
it's been a lot of years ago now. Um, and I started playing with it for our guys and put it out there in some of the social media groups for SM and CM. People really started trying it and we were getting mixed results. About 50% of the people would say, oh my gosh, this is the best thing ever. I've been able to decrease my pet's pain medications mm. significantly. And, you know, unfortunately we, we didn't have, um, it would have been nice to have like a, a study where we were tracking which product mm. everybody was using so that the ones that we were seeing good results, you know, maybe we could say, oh, look, they were all using this type of product or yeah. this specific product versus the others that maybe they were taking hemp seed oil. I have no idea because yeah. uh, there was no controls over anything. It was just like, hey, everybody try this and see what you yeah. think. Uh, so for some, it has been uh, really miraculous and um, pretty nice. I mean, the, the drugs for these dogs aren't cheap. Uh, CBD for a high quality product is not going to be cheap. Um, but it is kind of one of those things that you get what you pay for. Um, and that yeah. doesn't mean you need to go buy the $500 bottle unless you're buying, you know, the 5,000 milligram strength for your horse. Um, mm -hmm. those are, those are pricey. Yeah. <laughs> I and bought horses, those for my horse. horses are like dogs. They tend to be pretty sensitive. They don't need a, a lot. Oh, my and horse they, did great. He had EPM. Um, okay. and, uh, he was staggering, fall, leaning on walls. He, he couldn't walk uh -huh. a straight line at all. Um, and we were treating him for the EPM with the drugs, but he just wasn't really improving, uh, like we wanted him to. And I was really afraid we were going to lose him. And I said, well, I got nothing to lose. I'm getting this heavy duty CBD for him. And literally within three days, huge improvement. And he actually recovered at the end of his um, 30 or 45 days that we ended up treating him. He was back to normal from it. So <laughs> that's awesome. I know CBD. That was like, all right, CBD on board. Let's roll. I mean, that, that was the, that was five, six years ago, at least. Oh, awesome. um, yeah. So it, it was pretty amazing to me. Um, okay. So Auntie Dolores, did that move to Nashville as well? Yeah. 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 We're based here in this house. Basically, this is our new headquarters. All That's my awesome. team is working from home and, you know, we've got contract manufacturers in a few different states. So, so Auntie Dolores is the human product. Does that have THC in it? Not anymore. Yeah. We started off as a THC product company in 2008. This is long before CBD was even on our radar. Oh. Uh, but since then we've morphed quite a bit. We don't do THC products anymore. The regulations are really tough to work with it's and pain. we're confined to California or confined to one state with those products. So uh, we morphed into a CBD human product line and we just released uh, four new products. So we've got dropper bottles and hand sanitizer and topical. So lots of fun stuff. Cool. There. Yeah. So, so because it's a CBD product, you can sell that nationwide. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. So we sell it online and we sell to uh, many stores as well. Even some of our pet stores carry both product lines now because pet parents want to have the CBD as well. Well, sure. Very cool. Brandon, how do people uh, get a hold of you? Where do they get information from you? Uh, well, some of the common questions, we've actually got a few blogs at naturallyhealthyhemp.com that kind of goes over some of the terminology and Hopefully as soon as Black Friday is over, I've got a great one on how to read a COA and kind of break it down as simple as possible. And I've been working on that one for a while now, uh, probably about three months with the baby. So it might be <laughs> uh, I've uh, been to your house. It's really difficult to concentrate on anything more than about 32 it seconds. It is. <laughs> uh, our big thing with Naturally Healthy Hemp, and since we vouch for the products and we carry these wonderful companies, but we don't actually make it ourselves. It frees us to have so much time to go into the research and the education and be able to answer these questions one-on-one. -on -one. So I always encourage everybody that uh, Naturally Healthy Hemp LLC is our Facebook. Brandon at naturallyhealthyhemp.com will go straight to me. Um, if you go through the contact form on our website, if you have questions about dosing, what product you should take, specific issues. Um, I even have a pretty good veterinarian that will sometimes take my phone calls in the middle of the night when I'm answering emails. Because um, so, yeah, I don't we, sleep. 
but we try and do as much as we can to work one-on-one -on -one with the customer and really just make sure that we hit all those bases. And um, we actually did receive an email. We opened it up. Um, Teresa Carpenter emailed in and asked about CBD for uh, insomnia and sleep. Very fitting, because uh, I know at least two thirds of this chat room really don't sleep. And, uh, I think <laughs> considering uh, treatables and anti dolores, I don't think Juliana sleeps that much either. <laughs> um, but she wanted to know about sleep uh, insomnia and whether or not CBD would help. And also, um, sorry, let me pull up the email. I want to make sure that I actually get it 100%. But she wanted to know if insomnia and sleep disturbances could be helped by CBD. And also if it was safe for somebody with a history of high blood pressure. And uh, that was something that I did some quick research uh, just uh, this morning while we were trying to moderate all the chats. Uh, we found two studies, uh, both showed, uh, I think, was it 72 men uh, were given CBD and 66% reported that they slept better uh, in cases with insomnia. And I know there are a lot of good research out there with companies looking to use CBD for blood pressure medication that maybe one day, five, 10 years from now, the FDA might actually clear. Um, but uh, Teresa, I will email you directly uh, with the research information. So I just want, since we promised we'd uh, get uh, questions then. See, that's why we have Brandon, because he'll research that stuff. <laughs> And it's funny because, you know, there's another cannabinoid that comes from hemp and cannabis and it's CBN. And that's actually the cannabinoid that's fantastic for insomnia and sleep because it's got that sedative quality. CBD doesn't really have that sedative quality, but what it does do, which can help people sleep better, is it takes away anxiety. So if you're somebody that lies in bed and ruminates about this, that, and the other and can't sleep because anxiety is keeping you from sleeping, then by all means, CBD might help you sleep. Oh, but I got to give my mom a whole bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I personally haven't had any luck with it for sleep. Um, my daughter, on the other hand, she tells me she takes 150 milligrams before bed and she has the best night's sleep ever. So there's got to be something <laughs> to it. It might require high doses. Humans need a pretty high dose anyway, but it's definitely worth a try. I mean, Are there any CBN products out there? There's not because it's really hard to extract it and isolate it and, and make it a major cannabinoid in a plant. So it's, it's almost impossible to bring that CBN level up to where you'd find the CBD levels in a hemp plant. Um, I was hoping to make some CBN products a few years ago, but it very expensive <laughs> to, to extract it. Maybe someday they'll be able to figure out how to do that. It'd be great. Yeah, it would. It would. Some pharmaceutical company somewhere is going to figure out how to how to yeah. mimic that. Yeah. All right, uh, Hugh, if you can cue up some music for us, uh, I'm I'm hopeful that this has been helpful for pet owners out there looking to incorporate CBD. Uh, we've been incorporating it for years and have been very very happy uh, with that. Juliana and Brandon, thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. Pet owners everywhere appreciate all the work that you do for them. And uh, for those of you who have been with us all day, our next uh, session will be at 7 p.m. with Dr. Ian Billinghurst, Jousting with Raw and Degenerative Diseases. And remember, he wrote that book, Pointing the Bone at Cancer. So maybe we can get a little bit of that information out of him as well. Uh, really looking forward to, to that interview. He is uh, a just man with a lot of information in his head so thank you very much for joining us this afternoon uh brandon go give go give my granddaughter a hug for me and <laughs> you could actually give your wife a hug for me as well <laughs> i definitely will uh, thank, thank you so you. much for having me Appreciate thank that. you well, thank you for having me on and thank you for joining us juliana it's always Absolutely. great thanks again it's a lot of fun bye guys always is bye guys bye.